again, I appreciate everyone giving us some of your time today. My name is Jay Fisk. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Powerhouse Dynamics. We're the makers of the Open Kitchen by SightSage Equipment and Energy Management Platform. And uh, we're sponsoring today's webinar, and we are thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Hal King, whom I'll introduce in just a minute, um, to talk about how to reopen your restaurant safely. Uh, just a few points on today's webinar. This session is being recorded. So if you or your colleagues uh, want to go back and either revisit or see it if you were not unable, if you were unable to attend, uh, we'll be publishing a link uh, to view a recording of the webinar uh, when we are done. Uh, the webinar is, we've carved out a full hour and we'll certainly take it if we have lots of questions. We are planning on about 35 to 40 minutes of presentation with a brief demonstration of the Open Kitchen platform, followed by uh, Q&A. Uh, so if you do have questions, everyone's on mute, but if you do have questions, you'll see in the GoToWebinar app, there's a questions window. Uh, please type your questions there, and uh, we will do our best uh, to address them uh, during the Q&A session toward uh, the end of the session. Uh, also, uh, over the course of the webinar, we're going to be conducting three polls, um, and uh, we're just hoping to get a little audience participation and get some kind of real-time feedback on these issues uh, that we're seeing here with COVID-19 and the impact on the food service industry. Uh, and so just to kick things off, so you'll see on, in the GoToWebinar app, there's a poll section. So I'm going to uh, address the first uh, poll or launch the first poll right now. Just curious to get a sense for of our folks in uh, the audience, what percentage of your restaurants are currently open? Currently open. We know that the uh, country is beginning uh, to reopen. Curious to get folks um, feedback on that. So uh, when you have um, a minute, please uh, send your feedback to us. We'll keep that poll open for, for just a little bit. Um, so there will be other polls as we as we progress in uh, in the webinar. So we'll give uh, the poll about uh, another five or ten seconds to go. Um, but while we're um, doing that, uh, again, just to reiterate, questions are in the question uh, portion of the GoToWebinar app, and uh, we'll do our best uh, to address them there. Okay. So with that, uh, I'm going to close this first poll. And we're going to get on with the content today, again, how to reopen your restaurant safely, uh, featuring Dr. Hal King, uh, President and CEO of Active Food Safety. So we're going to do a quick round of introductions. Um, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit, then I'll transition to Hal King to give a bit of a background on foodborne illness uh, transmissions, specifics around COVID-19 transmissions, and then really the meat of the presentation, which I think what a lot of folks are here for, um, which is the preventive measures, um, uh, employee screening, personal hygiene controls, uh, environmental contamination controls, systems for supporting these kinds of controls. Then I'll transition to Jason Roeder for a brief demo and followed by Q&A. So with that, just briefly, uh, who is Powerhouse Dynamics for the sponsor of today's webinar? We are a technology company based just outside of Boston. We are uh, a unit of Middleby. Um, we're the developers of the SightSage Open Kitchen platform, which is an equipment and energy management system used uh, by large regional and national chains of restaurants, convenience stores, and others uh, in the food service industry. Uh, so today's featured speaker is Dr. Hal King. Uh, Hal is the managing partner for Active Food Safety LLC. He is a public health professional who has worked in the investigation of foodborne and other disease outbreaks uh, at the CDC Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, he's performed funded research on the causation and prevention of infectious diseases at Emory School of Medicine. And he's worked in the design and implementation of preventative controls for food safety hazards in the food industry, uh, formerly as uh, director of food safety uh, and product safety uh, at Chick-fil-A. Uh, Jason Roeder will be giving a demonstration of the Open Kitchen platform briefly following Hal's comments. He is our senior director of product management here at Powerhouse Dynamics. And again, I'm Jay Fisk. I lead business development and I'm the moderator for today's session. So with that, 
let me transition uh, to Hal and let Hal uh, provide his commentary. So Hal, please uh, share with us your thoughts. Hal, we cannot hear you right now. If you can hear us, yeah, sorry. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a nice little reminders here. Okay. So I think you can see my screen now, right? We can. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, thank you, thank you, Jay um, and Jason, for the opportunity to talk to many of your clients and um, the industry on this webinar as it relates to reopening our restaurants. We, I think, all of us in this industry that support the industry or actually work in the industry or have worked in the industry um, all have great concerns of how, how to get these um, economic uh, drivers of our, of our economy back um, strong and even grow stronger. Um, and so it's very, very important that, um, to be able to provide these types of different perspectives. We know there's lots of webinars and lots of perspectives and lots of experts out there. Um, I always tend to um, point people to the CDC for the guidance on public health and FDA for the guidance on food safety. Um, but there's a lot of folks that have actually done a lot of this work um, in the industry um, where they've actually had to apply a lot of those guidances that are, are that are very specific as it relates to functions and actions, but also have to be kind of adopted or adapted to the, the business itself. And we all know that food service is a very challenging uh, business as itself um, um, in a restaurant business. And especially now when we have respiratory virus, we have to have to control in, a, in that closed environment. You know, can we actually open restaurants back safely? And can we keep the public safe while this is, um, pandemic is still going on? Um, so I'd like to go back to um, the kind of pro the pre-COVID-19 um, situation because even before we were thinking about respiratory viruses like COVID-19, um, we were still dealing with a significant amount of foodborne illnesses in the United States. You can see here, this is the latest data that's um, statistically valid from the CDC showing the top five, um, four pathogens. Norovirus causes the most number, the largest number of foodborne disease outbreaks um, in the United States, most coming from restaurants, um, many coming from restaurants, and again, Salinelli, Coic, um, Clostridium, Perfringens. As you can see, we've had that problem before we actually had this situation um, that we're dealing with today. And you can see, um, when you look at the different types of restaurants, um, sit-down dining, fast food, buffets, things like that, um, over 60% of the foodborne disease outbreaks in the United States pre-COVID-19 pandemic were being caused by restaurants. So, so restaurants were already kind of behind the eight ball having to deal with this stuff um, just for foodborne illnesses. And um, we weren't doing that great, but not that we all weren't doing great, but we weren't doing great as a nation. Um, and now we got to deal with respiratory diseases too. So you can imagine the economic impact already on a restaurant business, especially independents um, that are trying to struggle to keep the family business going and then have to deal with now a respiratory virus. And if you notice that the sit-down dining restaurants were the ones dealing basically with the most foodborne disease illnesses and sit-down dining is what we're talking about today. Can we go back into a restaurant and sit down? Fast food drive through and pick up and those kind of things um, certainly contribute to that. But um, you can see we're kind of in a big challenge today um, and we were pre-COVID um, pandemic. You know, I always like to serve this slide with my friends from Stop Food Born Illness because, you know, I have six grandchildren, um, five granddaughters and a, a new grandson. And, you know, the, um, several of the granddaughters already asked for, hey, can we go to McDonald's or Burger King or Mac or, you know, Subway or Chipotle or whatever it is. They, they, they know these brands already at four and five years old because um, they see us using them. And so but they're the most vulnerable. Um, and, you know, I don't show you the elderly. I, I, I just turned 35, so um, I'm not in that group of um, being an elder. I'm just kidding. I'm not 35. But um, the folks that are, are more vulnerable for COVID-19 are the 65 and older or those who have um, those kind of um, underlying conditions that might be susceptible to infection. But now look at the complex here where foodborne diseases are significantly impacting children. COVID-19 less, less, so respiratory disease is causing significant impact and foodborne disease on, on the elderly population of those people that are actually, um, that are more susceptible. And if I, if I, if you're 65 and over and I call you elderly, I, I apologize for that. <laughs> I shouldn't say 65 or over. I'm getting in close to that age. Um, now, before pre-COVID-19, you know, the foodborne illness risk factors we all look at in FDA studies and CDC studies, because we all want to find ways to control these. Um, Pre-COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, that that basically contribute to these in food service 
are the ones we all know well, right? Food from unsafe source, sources, um, employees working sick with the virus, like norovirus, not cooking food, not holding food properly, and then contamination of equipment and food contact surfaces like called cross-contamination. Um, today, I'm going to kind of link to two primary controls, and I'll talk about, about those in a few minutes after I talk a little bit about the viruses that we're dealing with in food service. Um, is, that can be very useful for you applying the controls now for pandemic coronavirus and COVID-19, um, but they can also help you when you open back up or as you open up dining rooms and, and, and speed up and grow your volume of food service sales, you can actually increase the control of foodborne illnesses by the same exact control. So why not open up the restaurants and do both? Let's, let's drop these rates of foodborne illnesses in the United States and get a lot better while we're also now protecting our, our economy and our, and our businesses to and our customers and employees from COVID-19. So I'm going to use this as an example. This isn't the way all foodborne illnesses are transmitted, but many are. Um, and norovirus is a great uh, subject matter because norovirus is not spread from the air. We all know that it's a, it's a direct contact of surface to hands, to mouth, to food, or cross-contamination food. So when you look at this transmission of this virus, this is a foodborne disease virus, um, it basically circulates in a restaurant. It goes into the environment on um, high-touch surfaces. We hear that a lot on doors handles and um, equipment handles, and um, employees don't wash their hands properly, or they maybe they do, and they put gloves on, but then they touch those things with their gloves. And then they end up touching food and preparing food, and that leads to large numbers of people getting sick from um, norovirus and outbreaks. So the disease transmission of this virus is not in the air, it's just on surfaces, but you know the environmental surfaces are gonna be important for COVID-19 control too. Well, now we gotta deal with a, another virus in, in that environment, um, with COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, that's a respiratory virus. Uh, and so this virus is not spread necessarily um, as much on hands to surfaces to food. It's, it's spread from person to person in the air with the primary mode of transmission. And then, of course, we know it can be found and touched on surfaces by employees' hands, like coughing, um, not you know wiping their face or mouth, or and then touching surfaces. And then another person could actually touch that and then touch their eyes or mouth and actually tr and transmit the virus that way to them. Um, now look at the difference in obviously when you add a a respiratory virus that can go person to person in the air um, from droplets of um, coughing and sneezing or just breathing of someone that might be asymptomatic versus what you might see just in the more simple transmission of a norovirus to, to a surface and then to food. So um, we, we got a battle to fight here. Um, we're going to have to really ensure that we suppress the amount of virus that's in the air, make sure we practice the same controls, and we're going to show you those today, the environmental controls to practice to reduce the virus on surfaces so it can't be touched and moved back to people or to customers or to um, employees' hands um, where they can contaminate or ca cause transmission of themselves. Um, and then many of the controls we're going to apply can actually uh, mitigate both foodborne diseases and these viral um, diseases. And so, and Hal, this, so part of me, I, I'm just going to interject yeah. you just to, just to get some people's perspective. So just to share the results on the first poll, we actually had a fairly even distribution of, of responses in terms of percentage of restaurants that are currently open. So about a quarter of all the respondents are in each quartile. So a quarter of them are sort of zero to 25 percent, 25 to 50 percent, 50 to 75, 75 to 100 percent. So a fairly even distribution of folks who are you know, in various stages of, of open slash close. But I do want to get some feedback from the audience, too. The next poll is what percent of your restaurants were ever closed due to an employee who has tested positive for COVID-19? So I'm going to launch that um, poll right now um, while you talk a little bit more about um, some of these measures. Yeah, that's a, it's a that's something we're going to see a lot more now as we go back into um, expanding the business, bringing more employees into the restaurants, and we're even seeing some here that um, are testing positive um, in the workplace. Um, and then how are we going to deal with that? Um, obviously, the best thing to do is ensure that you can give confidence to the customers and to your employees that you've got the systems in place to try to eliminate that. Again, when you um, you might be told that an employee is tested positive by the health department or an employee might tell you that they've tested positive, or the employee might share with you they've got symptoms. But you really do need to have a control in place to ensure that you're, tra you're tracking that process so that you can actually ensure that on a regular basis at every shift, you're asking employees these symptom questions. And many are doing temperature checks um, with um, IR thermometers 
according to the FDA standards for being able to do that uh, type of check. But you really do need to have that screening process. You know, and I'll, I'll show you something in a little bit that's very interesting um, about the way the CDC looks at the most effective ways to to eliminate a pathogen in an environmental area that we might be exposed to. Okay, and that's respiratory and, and um, surface type pathogens like norovirus or COVID-19. And it's primarily going to be um, the ability to eliminate the pathogen from ever coming into the space. So the most important part of that right now is going to be that you have a process in place for controls to first employee screening and don't we call these wellness checks. And then if the employee were to work, say many have a, are asymptomatic or haven't been tested or the test results aren't back and they're working in the restaurant, then you need to have another hurdle that if they were there and if they were positive and maybe even asymptomatic, you have, an, you have another hurdle that the virus has to overcome. I call that virus mitigation. Um, that's common, common language for the way to see CFD look at this. Um, and those virus mitigation really needs to have two primary broad controls, personal hygiene controls, of the employee working with the food and working in those environments where the customers are working, and then the environmental contamination controls. Did you want to say something about that, Jay? About yeah, things? I just wanted to share a little bit of feedback. I was just uh, showing, I'll share it again. So um, about 41% 41, 41 of the respondents said uh, they have not, thankfully, had to uh, close because of positive uh, employee tests, but you know, uh, up to 10%. Uh, of uh, of stores in 44, almost half of the respondents have had at least some uh, cases where they've had to shut down because of, of positive employee tests. And thankfully, it does uh, trail off. Um, only 6% had um, more than 30% of, of restaurants closed due to uh, positive uh, COVID tests by employees. But we obviously, we all understand it's a mm -hmm. highly contagious uh, problem. And so uh, I think uh, you, you've got some good countermeasures here. Yeah, I am. Um, it's it's a very common question I get. Um, is um, if an employee tests positive, what should we do? Of course, you have to go by the state guidelines or local guidelines. Some states or local guidelines require you to shut the restaurant down according to the CDC guidance. Um, you can voluntarily shut the restaurant down um, if you want to show the customers and the, um, your community um, you're taking it seriously. That's kind of what I would recommend. I'm not saying you have to do that. Again, if the person tested positive had no symptoms, we don't know how much virus is being shed based on when they were actually um, tested and when they actually might get disease or never get the, the full disease. They can still shed the virus. We just don't know how much and when. We know it's about 48 hours before they could get symptoms, but if they never get symptoms, we don't suspect they'll get a lot of virus transmission. So it's a tough thing to kind of balance, but um, the CDC guidance is to shut down the areas where the employee worked for 24 hours to let the airflow change. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes and then also have a process of deep cleaning. And many restaurants in where I'm living right now who've had tested positive employees are doing just that, just to basically align with the CDC guidance saying we're doing what the CDC says, even if they're not required to. We're shutting down for 24 hours. We'll open up tomorrow. We just want to make sure everything's done the proper way and then we'll get back in business. But again, wearing the mask, having the employees wear the mask, having all the other things we're going to talk about here for the customer confidence is going to be key to that. So, you know, in this in the preventive measures, which we've talked about um, in prevention of COVID-19, that will also help prevent foodborne illnesses. Um, we we are going to discuss now what these are as it relates to um, what the CDC and FDA guidance is and then how to apply that guidance. Um, to your restaurant business. Um, the FDA guidance and CDC based science, bases the science on this um, primarily for the COVID-19. Prior to COVID-19 and the, um, the pandemic, um, we were always needing, we always were supposed to be screening employees for illness for things like um, vomiting, jaundice, um, sore throat, diarrhea, just to make sure they don't work with foodborne illnesses that they could spread. Again, especially to vomiting diarrhea, if they have more virus, they're likely going, they're going to shed it in that environment when they come to work. It's impossible just to keep it out. Um, and so, but now in the new guidelines that CDC also adds to that, um, we need to be looking at um, feeling sick or feverish, um, fever, cough, those types of things which are related to COVID-19. So this even tells you the more you really need to have a wellness screening process with checking for signs and symptoms and a means to exclude the employee. Once you exclude the employee, you really need to make, have a means that they don't come back to work. Um, it'd be horrible that you find an employee, they have you know, um, all these one of these symptoms, either foodborne illness or cough or fever, and you send them home and then 
the guy or gal two days later needs to get in a you know labor and puts the person back on the schedule. Um, so it's really important that once you exclude, you have a process to ensure you don't let them come back to work unless according to the CDC guidance. Now, FDA guidance for food is usually 24, 48 hours or um, no no um, further disease symptoms plus an okay by the health department, whereas COVID-19 is by the CDC guidance. Sometimes it can be up to 10 days. They should not come back to work. They've tested positive with no symptoms, but you can get those guidance. They would be happy to help with that, um, both of us uh, and here on that webinar. Um, the owner operators need to tra track that sick log as a means to ensure um, that person doesn't come back. And this is just an example um, that folks are used, folks can use, but just kind of give you an idea that you need to really have that in place. Um, and then some folks can check that to make sure the employees are there. It's also useful that while you're doing a daily assessment of food safety checks and COVID-19 checks, like for disinfection of surfaces, that you could actually check to ensure no employees here today, right? You'd like running around looking and checking and asking questions. You go, uh, how? You're not supposed to be here today. What are you doing here? Um, you were excluded because you said you had diarrhea, so it's really critical. Now, the, the two, after employee wellness checks, which is trying to follow the CDC guidance to eliminate the pathogen from the environment. So if you don't or aren't able to do that, again, um, the employee doesn't know they're sick, uh, they come to work, they might be asymptomatic. It's just impossible to know, right? Um, we really need to make sure we have other barriers. So personal hygiene controls are very common. Um, we've been using these and should be using these to prevent norovirus or other foodborne diseases in restaurants. So they're easy to adopt for pre um, for post COVID-19. So before this, obviously washing hands, um, using gloves properly. Um, we recommend a double hand wash so we kind of get employees trained that whenever they leave the kitchen or the service area, they're going to, before they come back, they have to wash their hands in the bathroom and can wash their hands in the kitchen. But we always basically made a process that if we see you leave the, the kitchen or the cash register area or service area and you come back in, there's a hand wash that has got to take place. That at least gives you confidence that once happening, um, if they may have skipped it in the bathroom, you can't always wash them in the bathroom, of course. Um, I've always recommended to clean, to clean and sanitize your hands, um, like we clean and sanitize dishware and clean and sanitize food contact surfaces, because you know that gives us just an extra process of sanitizing your hands when we don't wash your hands well. Um, they do, some employees get do that quickly; they don't do it right. Um, the soap may not be the proper soap because it might be a cheaper soap that may not actually get all the grease and oil and chicken fat and things like that off the hands. So I like the sanitizer step because it's just like another way of ensuring you kill pathogens on hands that you might not otherwise do. And then, of course, when they're wearing gloves properly. Um, and so, but other personal hygiene controls now need to be put in place for um, the post-COVID-19 situation we're in. Obviously, personal space or distance, we hear that all the time. It is still critical. Um, we know that um, the, the amount of virus people breathe in based on the amount of virus someone might be shedding that has it. And again, we don't know those kind of parameters because we can't see the virus. We have to have a way to ensure that, that we don't have a, a higher dose of that going on. And the best way to do that is step social distance yourself from them. Um, the next best thing to do with that is to ensure that we're always wearing masks. It'd be great if all the customers wore masks and all the employees wore masks in these systems. But again, we can't eat. I think um, Jay was even, we were talk, talking about how do we eat with these things and you know, it'd be nice to have a, a window there or something on it. But you know, we're in a new normal, right? And so we really do need to have the mask. The mask are not the type of PPP, PPE that would protect a healthcare worker working in a hospital from someone that's got sick and they're coughing with the disease. They'd have to have an N95. When I worked with um, at the CDC and worked with a lot of dangerous pathogens, HIV, tuberculosis, more respiratory pathogens like tuberculosis and Legionnaire's disease, we had to wear N95s because we didn't want to get that pathogen we're working with in the lab. And so that was the only guarantee we could work with it and be safe with it. But we don't have any 95s and there, you know, we need to have them for the healthcare. So the, the government and others have basically said we should, the next best thing would be cough mask. But remember, a cloth mask on me and no cloth mask on you is not the same as a cloth mask on me and cloth mask on you. When we both have them on, we reduce the amount of virus that's going back and forth between us. Um, and then, like I said, the sanitizer, you know, having something out front with a sanitizer to always clean and sanitize your hands, but then periodically throughout that work shift and employees and customers need access to that. We're just kind of reducing the potential for virus, <laughs> cough on your hands, get some sanitizer, come into the restaurant, I open the door, no one no one had it set, you know, automatic, so I'm touching the door, the customers have touched, 
in the handle, well, I know I can get a sanitizer at 60% alcohol. I'm reducing the amount of virus that might be coming into that, um, that facility. Um, there's a lot of good guidance. CDC has the guidance, and a lot of folks have come along and tried to help explain some of the guidance as it relates to the mask use. Um, how do you recommend that you make sure that that's good kind of um, process is in place? If you're using disposable masks, like disposable gloves, it's not that big of an issue. But if you're going to try to reduce costs and use reusable cloth masks, you got to worry about the mask being contaminated itself. So just make sure you have these types of processes in place to do that. Um, always would promote more frequent hand washing. Again, that reduces the, the amount of virus being spread. That's good for norovirus too and other foodborne diseases. Um, that could be spread and transmitted in these environments. Um, the more you do that, the more you reduce that um, surface that's going to spread and transmit, again, that virus to other surfaces. Remember, surfaces are bad with virus on them, so we're talking about reducing the risk of transmission. And then gloves are very important, but gloves, I see gloves used a lot now where people put them on. I see employees tend to use them to protect themselves. They're not thinking that, okay, I'm touching this, touching this, touching this, and there might be spreading the virus by tr and transmitting it up to these types of surfaces that then can be transmitted to people by them touching those surfaces. So just make sure that you have a glove process in place to mark the proper glove use, because they can actually be a vehicle to transmit viruses to surfaces. And then lastly, the most important part of um, this intervention to reduce the viral spread and virus transmission, um, both for foodborne illnesses and for um, COVID-19 is really to understand the difference between pre-COVID-19, which was to ensure that we clean and sanitize surfaces. And we all know what clean and sanitation um, steps are for um, preventing cross-contamination of food. But now in the new norm where we have a COVID-19, we need to disinfect surfaces. Um, it doesn't mean that cleaning and sanitizing may not kill the virus. Cleaning in itself can remove the virus off the surfaces. Um, and this sanitation might reduce some of the virus load. But we all know we have a guarantee that with the disinfect, with the disinfectant, it will kill the virus, even if it's not completely cleaned. Um, it actually has to be cleaned and disinfected it's, um, but to get the most effect effect efficacy. Um, but this is very critical because you know a lot of folks ask me, we're, we're cleaning and sanitizing the dining room tables, and really you need to be cleaning and disinfecting the dining room tables because that's really where you're worried the most about COVID-19 touching tables as customers come in and use those surfaces. So you want to make sure you have a process in place to do that. Um, you know, the CDC um, doesn't just assume, neither does the FDA, that everyone knows and understands this. Um, we do, we as in the business, need to understand it well. So there's guidance there for the public um, and businesses. And if you really want to understand more detail about this, um, to ensure that you're doing proper sanitation and disinfection of surfaces, you need to, to address those and look at those guidances. Just a few, just a few ideas. You know, one of the things that I always was worried about was the cleaning tools and the cleaning containers and things being used to actually transmit um, the the pathogen we're trying to kill with this, these type of technologies and systems and stuff. You know, I was always worried about using these things in the bathroom and then someone takes the bucket or and brings it to the kitchen and uses it there. Well, could it transmit the virus to the surface from the bathroom to the kitchen? Absolutely, it can. So using things like color-coded equipment and tools to kind of segregate, I recommend set up, you know, maybe a color for cleaning and sanitation systems and then maybe another color for cleaning and disinfection systems, things like that that just help you make it easier to train an employee to do something that they might get a quick training on and then make sure it kind of sticks when they're using that. Another one, if you've heard me talk many times or many it's any of our publications that um, I've just, my pet peeve is these, these buckets of water that we store or reuse with tiles in. Um, these, these are important in food service. We don't, we can't get rid of them because we need uh, something to be able to take reusable cloth towels to clean really dirty equipment, um, equipment that's been used to cook chicken or french fries or oil, or you know, we're gonna clean up a place where we're breading chicken or um, prepping biscuits, things like that. We're gonna need that, but that's to clean. You know, I don't like these to actually sanitize because you're going to need something to actually get clean surfaces clean. But once they're clean, we need to actually use something different to sanitize the surface. So I don't like these for both cleaning and sanitation. I see it all the time, but they just basically, the employees are, don't really get the training and they think this is 
going to do both. And it really doesn't. It actually spreads the germs if it's not used properly. So it does have allowance. FDA, FDA does allow its use, um, but it has to be used properly. And if you're going to use it, you need to make sure you follow the guidelines to keep the product, um, you know, keep those tiles clean and make sure the solution has got the right concentration of sanitizer so you're not actually growing germs or spreading germs from the vehicle. Um, I recommend that you move to something that is going to help employees just do what they need to do properly without going to grab this standby, you know, that they tend to forget and just use it to get the job done. I like pre-moistened wipes. I'm not, I'm not saying I endorse any one product, but a disinfectant that's on this EPA registration as for this example, um, the EPA, li EPA list is where you go to see um, if the uh, product actually kills COVID-19, then you have confidence it does. Pre moisture wipes are, are cool because they basically have been ripped out, you know, clean the surface and disinfect the surface, and then they throw them away. You kind of throw the germs away. Okay, where where else do you need to kind of focus this? Obviously, dining room tables where customers are eating, but all high touch surfaces. You hear that all the time, but you know, we, and these are some examples. Um, reusable condiment stations, they um, are high touch cabinet tables to store things, door handles to the bathroom, door handles into the kitchen, um, but buttons on the equipment that are used, those are all high touch surfaces. You're going to have to define that for yourself and maybe even make a map for yourself to make sure that they're hitting that on a regular basis because uh, it's going to be different based on these common ones, but there might be other ones. And then finally on the environmental contamination control process, um, I just like to kind of interject this. Um, this this will be available to you off um, as a recording, but um, you can get this off the CDC website. If you have an employee that tests positive, and CDC has recommended that you basically close their facility for about 24 hours and do a deep um, clean and disinfection of all the high touch surfaces and all the facilities, um, that that's something that where you might actually do the enhanced. Um, decontamination of that environment. So you might have an employee test positive from your wellness check. Well, now you're going to have to en enhance your environmental contamination control here. So I just want to remind you to do that. And then lastly, um, what our, our, um, our friends at Powerhouse Dynamics actually do a lot of this. And I was really fascinated to learn all the things that they do to help us monitor some of these things from HVAC controls to equipment use or air turnover, things like that. I'm, I'm going back to this CDC um, recommendation that the most effective way to keep pathogens like norovirus or um, COVID-19 from causing transmission, to, being transmitted to people and causing disease is to eliminate them, right? So number one, try to do employee wellness and screening and keep them out if you can. But we know that's not going to be the most, that's not going to work all the time, right? Um, if you look here, the CDC says the next most effective means is engineering controls. Try to separate the people from the pathogen. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few seconds about how that can be done in this new normal. CDC has actually put out some new guidance on that. You see at the very bottom, the least effective is masks and gowns. Now, that doesn't mean masks don't work. And if you don't have engineering controls and you don't have elimination of the virus and those coming into the facility, that's all we got, right? So you got to make sure training's happening and the masks are being used properly. Because if you eliminate those, you're, you're in serious trouble. Um, matter of fact, a recent study actually showed um, that's listed here that the, um, the adoption of engineering controls can be have a significant impact on the amount of virus risk to um, cause um, transmission to um, customers and employees. You can kind of see that this was from this document, this um, public, recent publication, that if um, the virus was in droplets or close um, quarters, that if you were able to circulate that air to remove the amount of virus or use ventilation, CDC talks about those two as primary means. Um, and then even if you could do disinfection of that air, a lot of companies make products that actually disinfect the recirculated air. You're just trying to kind of keep that virus low down so you reduce the probability of someone actually breathing it in and get, or getting onto surfaces and being transmitted. I love this, I love this document from the Japanese, um, from the prime minister's office. I just, you know, to be able to say, look, closed spaces with poor ventilation, and this is more for the customer, right? This is what they're telling people to do, not, not to go into these types of places. So if you're in a, running a business, you know, that's not doing these things, that you're gonna eventually be found out that you need to be doing these things, all these controls, including the wellness checks, environmental controls. So crowded space is bad, closed space is bad, poor ventilation, those kind of things are what the public's gonna to be told. So you might open up, you have some cases, and then you're not gonna be open up for very long, so it's very important. And then finally, the standard practice for these type of systems um, is through this, um, this group, um, ASHRAE, I can say that properly, 
um, CDC actually defaults to that standard NASH rating that tells you, but CDC does have the proper procedures for the type of air, air, air turnover, how much air to turnover you need to have. But remember, these are these are things that experts need to do for you in indoor spaces to kind of reduce the threat. And you can even tell your customers you're doing it. It's a good thing, good, good PR for that. But again, it's an environmental contamination control. It's very, very important that you have all of these in place to reduce the spread of the virus to the air and to the surfaces. And then finally, the best thing, we're going to kind of transition here in a few minutes um, to the best way to do all this um, to ensure it's happening. How, think about all these things, glove use, hand washing, employee wellness, how's not supposed to be working today, um, washing hands properly, air turnover, HVAC controls. How, how do you manage all those things and ensure that you can focus your time and effort on growing your business with great food and great customer service and giving an environment that's safe for your customers? Well, you're going to need a, a compliance system. You're going to need systems that can help you ensure that the compliance is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the FDA has actually shown that in foodborne illnesses, that when you look at um, having a, a presence of a food safety management system in place, we're actually ensuring compliance on a daily basis versus just not doing that at all and like waiting for the health department to come in and inspect you or a third party audit, that you can have a significant reduction of the foodborne illness risk factors, which is what we all use to measure whether the risk of someone getting sick from food is present in this environment. So why not? Why wouldn't you do that? They've proven that these things work, but you're gonna need a system. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, for whoever makes paper, I just don't think paper checklists are gonna do it. You can't have a paper let checklist give you a notification that someone forgot to actually disinfect the bathroom or disinfect the high touch surfaces. So it's gonna be really critical. So I'm gonna stop right there and then turn this over to Jason so that you guys can kind of see how this might work. Yeah, great. Thank you, Hal. And in the, in the transition here, we actually have our last poll that I'd love to engage with folks, which is touching on some of the things that Hal just mentioned is, are you using any technology today to manage HACCP or COVID-19 requirements? And so we've got a poll I'm going to launch right now. Just pick if you're using any of these things in your locations today, whether they're digital task lists, um, infrared temperature sensors for employee screening, uh, internet connected uh, temperature sensors for tracking refrigeration, internet connected cooking or hot holding equipment for pulling that data down automatically uh, or not if you've got manual or paper-based processes just curious to see um, what uh, what kinds of, of tools and techniques people are applying today uh, to address some of these uh, some of these preventive measures and then I'm going to uh, transition to Jason Roeder uh, who's going to give uh, just a quick mm -hmm. demo of some of the tools that we have in the open kitchen platform that can support both digitizing some of the, the wellness checks and, and task lists, as well as um, changing some of the uh, HVAC operating uh, conditions in support of the new ASHRAE guidelines for bringing in more fresh air and having, uh, and having more air turns. So uh, Jason, I'm gonna make you the presenter as we finish off the poll, I'm gonna close the poll and uh, just briefly um, share those results. So uh, interestingly enough, we've got about a third of the respondents um, saying they're using digital task lists, which is great. Um, almost half uh, taking uh, employee temps via infrared temp sensors, which is also, I think, is sort of a new thing for most of us. Uh, and then a smaller portion of folks using internet connected temp sensors or internet connected cooking equipment, uh, but about half of folks um, on on, uh, on paper processes uh, today. So uh, interesting. So thanks everyone for um, sharing your feedback. And with that, um, Jason, I'm going to uh, transition to you to uh, give a, just a quick demo of some uh, technology. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Jay. Um, let me begin sharing my screen here. And uh, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of items that Hal mentioned the first one related to what he referred to as engineering controls and uh, this relates to ventilation so for uh, companies that have an internet connected hvac control system like an energy management system or networked thermostats um, there is usually an opportunity to adjust the ventilation rate and i'm going to show you an example of that here in this picture here, we have a thermostat schedule that looks at each hour of the day. And during each period of the day, we can control whether the fan, which is what circulates air, is either running continuously, which we call on or always on, 
or whether it um, is in what we call auto, which means the fan only runs when the heating or cooling is called for. So the concept is very simple, is if you're looking to maximize your ventilation, what you want to do is you want to have that fan running all the time, um, which uh, does use a little bit more energy, but it maximizes uh, the ventilation. And this is something that CDC and ASHRAE have been recommending when it comes to COVID-19 and the fact that it is a respiratory airborne uh, virus in addition to surface. So that's, uh, that's one a piece of the puzzle. The other is I wanted to talk about uh, the kind of administrative controls or, or a system for controls, and this gets into the digital task lists and the ability to drive um, accountability across the organization at a time when we really need it. So this is an example of a mobile app where you can define what kind of tasks need to be completed and also when they need to be completed. So, you know, here are some, some very easy samples, but you can talk about lunch and say, all right, here is a special set of tasks we need to do above and beyond what we normally do specifically for COVID. So uh, just some basic concepts that Hal talked about disinfecting things. And when I complete these, there's a timestamp that's involved and also it logs what user of the mobile app has completed that task. Um, and in this way, we can be uh, sure that the tasks are completed when they need to be completed. Um, Hal mentioned the sick log. One thing you can do is, you know, make a, uh, a, a confirmation or track okay yep there was somebody here who was sick i'm going to take a note of it it was um you know um, sally m and uh add any other documentation i want to do and save and close that and now that's a digital record that can be accessed in real time across the entire enterprise and i'll give you an example of that here uh, where now if we look at um, our report uh, we get to see that the uh, sick log task has actually been uh, documented. It's actually just down on the bottom of my screen. I can't get to it at the moment, but this report can be accessible uh, anywhere uh, on the website or on the uh, on the mobile app. So it's very uh, flexible. Um, you know, in addition, one last piece. Speaking of the website, um, you can also track these things across. Uh, and what I mean by that is compliance with these policies across locations using uh, reports that will look across all of your uh, locations and your supervisors to try and make sure that everything is getting done uh, that needs to get done. And you can make sure to target additional training efforts in uh, areas where you uh, need them. Um, so this will uh, report here, we'll look at how many tasks were required, how many were completed. Oops. Sorry, my, my, uh, there we go. How many were requited and also required and how many corrective actions were uh, required and completed. So this is a way to be able to keep tabs across your whole organization in real time as to how your compliance is uh, being maintained. And then my last comment here, I know we're running a little bit out of time, is uh, as Jay mentioned, some of the uh, more advanced techniques now involve measuring individual cooking cycles for equipment. Uh, here's an example of an, uh, of an oven which is monitoring uh, the temperature of the food being cooked, as well as the oven, you know, in real time. And this is something that uh, is kind of, a, again, the, the future of, of where things are going to document and verify food safety practices. And uh, that's it. Great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so appreciate that. So with that, uh, Hal, thank you very much for your comments. Um, can you still hear us? We seem to have an issue with your camera. Can no longer see you, but that's okay. As long as we can hear you. Can we? Can yeah. you hear us? Okay, yeah, great. I'll, I'll, um, I'll that's yeah. okay. Uh, these things happen. We're all used to uh, the foibles of the internet in this uh, day and age of working remotely. Um, I do want to transition to, to Q&A. Uh, so we've got some questions. And just as a reminder to those in the audience, again, on the GoToWebinar app, uh, there's a questions window. So please type your questions in there and uh, I'll do my best uh, to address them. Um, but to kick things off, Hal, you know, one, one question that, that we've gotten, and I know that uh, you've probably had in the past as well, is, is there a, is there a, because a lot of what you talk about is the important, importance of wellness screening, right? And so is there a, a conflict or a concern between uh, HIPAA, so in other words, uh, medical uh, privacy laws around data, patient data, uh, 
uh, versus the need to document um, employee wellness as part of uh, preventive measures in COVID. So can you talk a little bit about um, any of the tension there between, you know, making, you know, making sure your employees are healthy and documenting it as such versus, you know, potential conflicts with, with HIPAA and privacy on, on medical data? Yes, there, there certainly is. You can't, you can't ask an employee, do you have AIDS, right, under HIPAA law. Um, AIDS is transmitted differently than in food, um, and it's not transmitted by the uh, by respiratory, right? But but HIPAA HIPAA law basically protects your confidentiality between you and a medical doctor or anyone else for your medical conditions. Um, however, there's an exception in the ADA, ADA, and the CDC actually has guidance on this too, that you are allowed to ask an employee if they have a foodborne illness like diarrhea or symptoms of foodborne illness. And then today, under most emergency orders, you're also allowed to ask if you have tested positive for COVID-19 or have had any signs and symptoms. So you are protected from those. Certainly doesn't mean people can't sue. Um, that's, you know, that type of um, thing can happen, but you are protected from that, um, that situation from those type of guidelines. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and if we, if we step back and we look at all the different preventive measures you're describing around wellness checks, um, task lists, um, you know, d engineering controls. Um, do you have a a sense for priority? You know, if you know, just in terms of the things that our, our our audience today should take away of all the things we describe. You know, what are the most important things they should do immediately? Um, because some of the things may require additional investment in infrastructure, process changes, etc. So, can you give a little more color on, uh, in your from your perspectives on on priorities? Yeah, I think the number one priority I would, if I had to choose one, I don't like choosing because I like the multiple hurdles like I talked about, um, but the number one would be the personal hygiene and environmental control, right? Because if you if you are able to say to yourself that I've got these the proper glove use, hand wash, surface um, disinfection, I've got the proper air turnover, I've got all these environmental controls in place, that if an employee works sick or has the virus and is shedding, or if a customer is sick and comes in and sheds the virus, I know I can reduce the potential for transmission to people. That's the number one priority. If I can say to myself, I can re re reduce that transmission, I have a safer environment for my customer and for my employee. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I think you have a fairly unique perspective on, just given how how deeply you are studying and involved in uh, in these kinds of issues, is your insights. And again, I'm I, I realize I'm asking for your uh, my predictions or perspective, but just as a as a subject matter expert, um, what is um, what are you anticipating over the next six to twelve months? Or you know, how do you think we're going to see COVID nineteen related mandates? Uh, for food service operators changing or, or being modified as we learn more and more about uh, this disease and its prevention. And so, you know, what are the kinds of things our, our audience members should be on the lookout for? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'll give you two answer to that question. My, my recommendation would be that we mandate, in other words, we, we have mandatory health inspections that we mandate that businesses like, especially food service, are required to use food safety management systems. Um, I'm not saying that because I just wrote a book on the subject. I'm saying that because the FDA has proven it works. It's actually in the FDA food code in Annex 4. I didn't write this, they did. The studies have been, they based that on a CDC investigations and other really high um, end academic studies showing that you will prevent foodborne disease illnesses if you have these systems in place. An audit is not enough. And so daily assessments, the daily controls, daily processes to track and ensure can help you ensure you've got management. You know, we don't, we can't, you always hear that, we can't um, control what you don't manage, right? Well, this, it really is true. you got to know. And that helps you protect yourself from false claims too, right? Someone comes and says, I got sick, I, this is what happened. You go, well, you know what? The probability of that happening, the day that you ate and on the timestamp of when you purchased the food is we didn't even serve that product. <laughs> You know, but that, that's kind of what you want to have because in social media, a few bad remarks can actually be lost sales. So really need, need to have these systems in place to ensure you protect your business. That's one. I think what's going to happen in COVID-19 is that now that we've got 
the knowledge of the need to do employee wellness screening for COVID-19, that you're going to see a lot of um, businesses require that, whether they're regulated or required by the government or not, because it's just good business. It's going to be very important to put these systems in place just to show that you've got evidence to your customers and to the broader community that you're doing the, everything you can to protect them. Before, it should have been done for foodborne illnesses, um, but now it's going to have to be done because everybody knows, right? Mm -hmm. People don't track foodborne illnesses. They don't talk about that much, although there's three to 6,000 people die every year from it. We talk about COVID-19. And so right. you're going to really need to make sure you have those systems in place. I think that's what's going to be the result. And even the pandemic goes away and we don't, we see it get a vaccine. This really wasn't the one pandemic we were all preparing for. I used to work in the U.S. Army Reserve and we work on pandemics all the time mm -hmm. um, in trying to prevent and understand what's going to come and how to mitigate it. Uh, many of these things we we've, we've talked about today are part of that puzzle, but there's a respiratory virus out there that's caused by avian influenza that could be even significantly worse than this. Um, and the one we see every year seasonally kills about you know 30 to 100,000 people with the same type of vulnerability, but very vulnerable children actually get it too. So we got to we just need to put these things in place and let them stick and stay in place because we got to get ready for what happens if the next one comes. You know, we put our guard down. We're going to lose everything from this. So mm -hmm. I recommend that we start now and stop yeah. the food losses too. Thank you. And I just, we've got a, a couple of, I'll say more sort of practical questions. You know, so if you are, a, um, I'm guessing the question is from a, a full service restaurant uh, operator. Um, can you comment a little bit about disposable wares versus, you know, regular dishes and knives and forks and, you know, or do, do, you know, what do you see happening there? Are there more convenient options than just sort of changing everything to paper plates or uh, any thoughts on, on what a full service operator might do as they consider, um, you know, COVID-19 mitigation when they, you know, reusing knives and forks and plates and yeah. glasses, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I think now's the time to switch. We all are, we all care about what we hear about is sustainability, but we do, do need to protect our environment and we don't need more trash and, and trash dumps and you know so we're going to need to speed up some of the innovation on these things that can be um, compostable or basically you know i've seen things that made of cornstarch they dissolve in water we're just mm -hmm. going to need to get better at creating less plastic waste and trash so i'm not advocating let's go to all the plastic wear and all that certainly it's safer than having to worry about re cleaning and sanitizing or the customer perception of safety. But let's not just go jump in and do that and only that. Let's just start moving to, if it costs two or three pennies more, or if it costs a little bit more, it's going to be important for you to sustain that anyway. So you might as well start adapting your business model to those sustainable processes with these types of things rather than just knee-jerk reaction to the plastics. And Because again, at some point, people are going to start worrying about that in their community again after this is over. And why, why not move to that? If you are going to use um, dining room service, and I, and I see I go to restaurants here. People are using them. Um, I think they need to be individually wrapped so that, you know, I think the napkin wrapped around, it doesn't give me a lot of confidence that the cloth napkin wrapped around the fork and knife and put on my table is actually been clean and disinfected. I'd like to do it, actually see it more individually wrapped or something that comes shows that, hey, it's been clean and disinfected, you know, where people are handling it back in the kitchen. Not that food is going to transmit the virus. It's not. Um, at least court currents that we know it's not. Uh, based on all that, but we, I think it just gives us more confidence, but not, you don't have to need your reaction, react to plastics, but you need to make sure you can experience safe with those things. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, we're just approaching the end here. So Hal, I know that you, you have a lot of clients in this space and are there any key questions that you, you get commonly that we haven't touched on today? Any sort of final thoughts you want to share with our audience? Yeah. Um, a couple one, a couple questions were, um, can we replace face mask, um, which are like the, pl the, the, the plastic guard. You know, we have plexiglass in front of all the cash registers. Now we go to, we go to the pharmacy, right? Or we go to grocery store. Um, so they want to know if we can actually use that on employees, a reusable face, face mask, I'm mean, sorry, face shield rather than a mask. Now a mask protects all the respiratory um, shed of virus and breathing in the virus from your respiratory system. But a, a mask, I'm sorry, I've got to get say that right. A shield, a face shield really just protects the virus coming at you, right? Um, it doesn't keep it from coming underneath, around. You can still get virus and get exposed to virus. So CDC that can put out guidance and that, that you really should not use a face shield in place of a face mask. Face mask is what you should be using. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, we have one, one more question around uh, dine-in spaces and your thoughts on 
uh, the proper amount of distance between seated patrons um, and also the placement of, of walkways versus tables. Do you have any specific guidance on, uh, around that? Just yeah, physical I think, distancing? yeah that, there's, a, there's a few studies that have just gotten published in the scientific literature showing that even people that were six, six feet away from others, but they were in a direct line of airflow um, from the people that were sick to the people that were not sick can still shed the virus to those people. But that doesn't mean that the six feet doesn't work. It just means you really need to be thinking about, and again, those people sat there for an hour and a half. And so in the scenario of coming into a dining room, we, that's why we kind of talked about that today. We really need to not, we need to think about what happens with the customers, focus that. We, we've all, we talked today a lot about what happens with the employees, right? Prevent, protect the employees, make sure they don't shed the virus. And most right. employees in most states are required to wear a mask, face mask anyway, which is good. But the customer, the customer's not wearing a mask. They're sitting there eating, talking. And so we're really going to need to start thinking about the customer on that side. Can we do other things besides the six feet? Yes, absolutely, six feet distance. Um, where's the airflow pattern going into that distance? If someone were sick and they came in and, and did not follow the requirements and they came in sick anyway, some might. Um, they just don't believe they're going to, you know, shed the virus or whatever. Um, that you got to be prepared the fact that someone could be infected by that process. So better to just start thinking about that now. Could I, if I have six foot distance, can I actually look at the airflow, the turnover airflow, and reduce the amount of virus that might be sticking there and hanging out there to all those people when they're in a, they're sitting there for an hour to eat. Yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. Uh, with that, I think we're going to uh, to wrap it up. Hal King, thank you so much My pleasure. Uh, for sharing your, your expertise with us today. Uh, very much appreciate uh, your, your insights. And thank you to everyone, uh, again, who carved out a portion of their day to join us. Uh, as I mentioned before, there will be a recording of this webinar made available. Uh, we will also publish a PDF uh, of, of the slides for folks back to refer to. Uh, of course, if folks have any questions about the technology behind some of the, the uh, tools, uh, you, you're always welcome to reach out to us at Powerhouse Dynamics. And with that, I bid everyone have a great day. Thanks, everyone, again.